Hi, welcome to this quick clip going through uh, the phenomenon of covalent character and ionic compounds. So, first of all, let's have a little look at some of the history behind this idea. In 1923, Kazemir Vejan puts forward an idea that cations or negatively charged ions uh, come from atoms which have lost electrons, but they can actually polarize anions, therefore pull electron density back towards themselves in spite of the fact that they've just lost electrons. Let me give you an example of how this might work. So if we take uh, beryllium chloride, um, the first thing you might notice is you've got a metal undergoing a covalent bond with a non-metal. So this compound would exhibit strong covalent character in spite of being made of a metal and a non-metal. So if we were to look at other group 2 chlorides, such as magnesium chloride or calcium chloride, for example, they'd be much more ionic in their character and their behaviour. So what's going on with beryllium? So let's remind ourselves of which type of ion each one forms. So beryllium forms two plus ions, but they're positively charged. These are called cations. And chlorine becomes chloride, and because chloride is negatively charged, or minus, we call chloride an anion. But obviously this would happen in ionic compounds. This is clearly a covalent compound. So the key is looking at the charge of beryllium and its ionic radius. So what this means is if you get a small radius but a high charge, you get what's called high charge density. The opposite happens if you get a large radius but a small charge. So beryllium has a relatively small radius compared to other members of group 2. So what happens is this means that the high charge density of beryllium is able to pull electrons back towards the cation. Therefore, what's happening here is beryllium is able to undergo a covalent bond with chlorine. So therefore, a chlorine atom can be pulled back to a beryllium ion. Now, the chloride Sorry, the chlorine atom doesn't want to give up its electron completely. So what happens is a compromise. They share. So therefore a covalent bond occurs. And with it comes covalent character. So coming back to the original idea of Fagin's rule. So the idea of polarisation can come from three scenarios, or combination thereof. High charge density in the cation, so small size but high charge. High charge density in the anion, large size but high charge. Or an incomplete outer electron shell in the cation. So I'll take a moment to explain that third point there. So here's another one, aluminium trichloride. Um, aluminium forms covalent bonds quite readily with uh, um, halide ions. So let's have a look and see if we can use the logic in uh, Phaedron's rules to work this out. So Al3 plus has a high charge, 3, but only 3 shells. So that means that aluminium 3 plus has what's called a high charge density. It's a cation because it's positively charged. So a chloride ion will actually have a much larger radius than a chlorine atom because what happens is the extra electron it's picked up will cause repulsion between the shells, so therefore the whole size gets bigger. So this leads to the large size of an anion. As well, if you look at the aluminium atom, you'll see it's got an incomplete outer electron shell. It's still only got six electrons instead of eight. So it's going to tend to try to pull more electrons towards itself. So all three criteria for Fagin's rules have been met. So that means aluminium trichloride has a very strong covalent character, even though, again, it's a metal and a non-metal that are bonding with each other. So covalent bonds are the order of the day. So what happens when you get small cations and large anions 
is there's a region where the electrons start to become more covalently bonded rather than an ionic bond. So if the three criteria on the right-hand side of the screen are met to some extent or another, you will get what's called um, more covalent character, even though you've got oppositely charged ions attracting to each other. So a little bit later on, an American chemist called Linus Pauling took this idea and developed it a bit further to devise a scale which compares the ability of individual atoms to draw electron density towards themselves along a covalent bond. So this idea is called electronegativity, and the difference in electroneg electronegativity between two bonded atoms will dictate where between the atoms the bonded pair of electrons will sit. So the effect is that more electronegative atoms will draw the shared electron pair closer to themselves compared to less electronegative atoms. So in general terms what happens is electronegativity increases as you go up a group and increases as you go across a period. So in any one group the smaller elements towards the top of the group will tend to be more electronegative even in the case of metals. This is because there's less shielding of the nuclear attraction towards electrons that might come in. So sometimes what happens is you get the anomaly that we've just discussed where a metal can actually start to pull electrons towards itself. So if we look at the examples, you can see beryllium, you can see aluminium. So the electronegativity values um, are provided. So just to finish off this short clip, um, if we look at the two diagrams, the diagram on the left has some um, radii, uh, radii of each of the um, ions compared to their atoms. So if you look at Be2+, you can see it's got a very, very small ionic radius. Al3+, has a very, very small ionic radius. So does Li+, again, very, very small ionic radius. So on the right-hand side of the screen, the diagram can then be justified in terms of the level of polarisation. So to sum it up, it can be said that the greater the degree of polarisation of the anion's electron density in a compound, the more covalent character that compound will exhibit. OK, so that brings us to the end of the theory behind this clip. So let's now try a question based on some data I found online. What we need to do is look at uh, the data and use a combination of the difference in charge between the cation and the anion, and the difference in the ionic radii. So I've calculated the difference in the ionic radii for you. And uh, looking at the difference in charge in each case, you can easily apply that as well. And then it's a combination of the two to, uh, that allows you to work out the most covalent and the least covalent. So the most covalent one is going to have the largest difference in charge, and the smallest um, ionic radius um, of the cation. In other words, the greater the difference in size between the cation and the anion, the more likely you're going to get polarisation and therefore covalent character. So we start off with calcium fluoride. That's going to be the most ionic, so that's the least covalent out of this lot. So I'm now looking at the difference in charge between the anion and the cation as well as the relative sizes of their ions. So I can think about to what degree um, the anion is going to get polarised. So a combination of charges and differences in ionic radius can allow us to start to work our way in from either side. So eventually we're able to put something together that might represent a possible ranking. So the approach we used was fairly simple. Um, we could make it more difficult if we wanted and more precise by looking at what charge density actually is. So charge density in reality is the spread of the charge over the surface of the ion. So you'd have to bring in things like the volume of the sphere and things like that. But this is just a quick review of this clip. It's not going into too much detail. 
it's just an introduction to some of the things you might need to consider if you were looking at uh, what level of covalent character you'd get in a specific pairing of ions. So, until next time, thanks for listening, and see you soon.